Hi everyone, I hope you are all doing well. So in our previous lectures, we looked at the segregation era, 1910 to 1948. Then we looked at the apartheid era, 1948 to 1955. Now our focus is going to be on the SEC2 era, 1955 to 1963. So on slide one, okay, there we go. So the South African Congress of Trade Unions was founded in 1955 under the declaration Organize or Stop. And it was built on the radical traditions like the Council of Non- European trade unions. Come to think of it, SACTA was formed immediately after the Trades and Labor Council dissolved as a result of the Council's refusal to include black trade unions. So to, organ to organize the unorganized, especially African workers into mass-based national unions, that would then challenge the power of the bosses. This was SACTA's primary task on the trade union front. So black trade unionism, it, it moved deeper into political arena following the formation of SACTU. So SACTU embraced two important principles, which was non-racialism and political trade unionism. So SACTU gained widespread recognition for its highly effective strike, strikes in the metal industry, manufacturing sector, agriculture, and mining and the bus boycotts and also stay at homes um, across South Africa. It also had strong connections with liberation movements and other international trade union organizations. So SACTU allied itself with prominent organizations like the ANC, the South African Indian Congress, the South African Colored People's um, Congress, and um, the Progressive Whites, which are the, were the South African Congress of Democrats. Together they formed a coalition which became, which was known as the um, Congress Alliance. So now let's define the ruling class. So the ruling class encompasses far more than the government in power. It is com comprised of two social groupings. So firstly, it's the capitalist class. So as the owners of the means of, these are the owners of the means of production whose members live off the profits derived from exploiting human labor power. And secondly, it's the entire state apparatus, which is the government, the legislature, the judiciary, the administrative bureaucracy, the police and the military. So together, both these social forces generally share the same overall interest in maintaining the status quo. And more specifically, the dominant relations of production and the capitalism. So both segments of the South African ruling class thought that the organization of African workers into economically and politically effective trade unions, this was a threat to the state structure of the apartheid institutions and the capitalist source of profits. So SACTU challenged the status quo. So SACTU challenged the status quo. So in view of the nature of the political opportunity structure of its time, SACTU I said to argue this, I'm going to read this quote. So its concerns included not only factory floor issues, but also township living conditions and the overriding problem of state power. A mere struggle for the economic rights of workers without participation in the general struggle for political emancipation would condemn the trade union movement into to uselessness and to betray the interests of the workers. This is what SACTU believed. So this participation in the Congress Alliance, it signaled that the labor movement recognized that the wage system in place was in fact sustained by the existing segregatory political system. 
So it recognized that that changing the political system was um, could be a solution to gaining workplace rights and better living conditions. So it therefore decided to move beyond the workplace to fight for a democratic political system. So sector leaders refused to divorce just the struggle for political rights and power from the day-to-day -day struggle for higher wages and improved working conditions. So now we're going to look at the Sinetu and the founding of SACTU. So in our earlier lectures, we spoke about how during the 1930s and the 1940s, the manufacturing sector experienced remarkable growth, coinciding with a significant expansion of the black pro 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 proletariat. So the African urban population tripled between 1921 and 1946, and this resulted in nearly one in four Africans residing in urban areas by 1946. So this urban migration was a direct consequence of the rapid development in the manufacturing sector during that period. So the process of organizing black workers into trade unions advanced through the formation of the Council of Non-European Trade Unions in 1942. So by 1945, Sinetu had some 158,000 members in 119 unions, and it represented 40% of the total African working employed in manufacturing and commerce. So during the... Um, so during the years of the war, organized workers experienced a bolstering of their bargaining position due to various factors. So the departure of white, white workers to support the war effort, the streamlining of production processes, the breakdown of traditional divisions between skilled artisans and unskilled labor, and the rise of semi-skilled operators all contributed to the shift. So as a result of these changes, the black proletariat witnessed significant growth in size and influence. Concurrently, their organization at, that, at the point of production, it led to a remarkable surge in strike action during the war years. So motivated to secure better working conditions and pay, black workers successfully campaigned for and, and achieved um, wage increases. So now we're going to look at how was the surge, um, upsurge contained. So there were two key aspects to the strategy um, aimed at containing the upsurge, which was rep rep repression and reform. So there was War Measure 145, which was enacted in December 1942, which set, which, which set strict penalties for workers going on strike while the United Party was contemplating the best way to handle the rising um, worker activism. And then B, there was the Fagan Commission. Um, it, acknowledged the un it acknowledged the ongoing urbanization of African workers in the manufacturing sector, and it sought to present exploitation in, um, in terms of class distinction rather than, um, the, rather than race. And then C, the National System of Labor Bureau was to be established and the past system replaced by simplified identification by a simplified identification system. And in 1947, the Industrial Conciliation Bill was imposed, aiming to diffuse African Union's bargaining power. It planned to do this by making strikes illegal, requiring um, government oversight for union official elections and mandating that disputes go through mandatory arbitration via mediation boards. So however, when the National Party took over in 1948, um, the Industrial Conciliation Bill was shelved and it, it was never introduced in Parliament. So instead, the National Party started a more assertive campaign. 
to augment and revamp control over the labor movement. So they completely denied any recognition to African unions. As such, acknowledgement, as such acknowledgement would mean accepting urban rights, a, con a concept they firmly, firmly rejected. So when the Industrial Legislation Commission um, appointed by the National Party and led by Buta, um suge suggested recognizing African unions, similarly to what was proposed in the previous bill, the Labour Minister um, Schumann responded by saying this. He said, if we give them the incentive to organize and should they become well organized, and again, bearing in mind that there are almost 1 million native workers in industry and commerce today, they can use their trade unions as political weapons. And they can create chaos in South Africa at any given time. I think that we would probably be committing race suicide if we give them that incentive. So this speech was given in response to a period of strong resistance um, from the exploited classes. So the suppression of the mine strike in 1946 brought together various opposition groups, leading to organized resistance through methods like stairways um, and passive resistance in 1949. So instead of acknowledging Afri African unions in, the, um, in this context, they were not recognized and trade union leadership was repressed. So the efforts to control the resistance went beyond non-recognition. Um, so changes were made to the Industrial Conciliation Act to rest restructuring existing unions along racial lines. So the amended act imposed racial segregation, prohibiting mixed unions, and requiring them to split into separate unions. If a majority of white or colored workers chose um, to separate. So statutory me measures were introduced to enforce racial um, segregation. So now when we look at the post um, war period, so after World War II, there was a significant reorganization um, of the labor process, resulting in the emergence of semi-skilled workers, mainly from the growing African working class. So this restructuring was known as rationalization, pose, which posed a threat to the trades and labor council unions, which represented um, white, colored, and Indian workers. So disagreements over how to respond effectively to these changes contributed to the TLC's decline and establishment of the Trade Union Council of South Africa in October 1954. So TUCSA supported recognizing, it recognized African trade unions and opposed racial provisions that segregated u u segregated unions. So they believe that maintaining mixed unions could prevent undercutting through closed, um, through closed shop agreements. So while TU TUCSA called for recognition, it actually excluded African unions to accommodate the pri to accommodate primarily white artisan trade unions um, stance. So in response to, to, you, to you CSA's rejection of African Union membership and their desire to control these unions, SACTU was formed in 1955 as a non-racial coordinating body. So SACTU aims to represent and empower African trade unions independently. So in contrast to the TUCSA orientation, SACTU developed a defined political unionism. So this tells us that unlike TUCSA, SACTU adopted a specific form of unionism that was more politically driven, while TUCSA may have focused more on labor issues such as wages, working conditions, and labor rights, SACTU defined political unionism. So suggest, they suggested that they tie labor activism with broader political objectives. 
So this could include fighting for overall societal change, challenging broader structures of power and inequality, or linking labor rights with la larger struggles for civil rights and political representation. So it's important to recognize that while some unions called for a no politics in trade union movements, SECTU is saying this type of political trade unionism is limiting and does not challenge the status quo. So now we're gonna be looking at people who laid the basis um, for the formation um, of SECTU. Okay, so these are really amazing people um, that you will learn about who laid the foundation um, for the formation of sector. So through the decades um, of struggle, there are many people who laid the basis for the formation of sector um, as the first non-racial trade union coordinating body. Um, yet these individuals were prevented um, except for underground activity from openly contributing after 1955. So let us look at some of these individuals and you will see how important um, the trade unions um, that came before SAC2 were in laying the basis um, for its formation. So like trade unions such as um, SINETU. So these were important for laying, um, you know, the foundation for the formation of SAC2. So the first individual we're going to be looking at, you can see her image on the far right. So this is Ray Alexander. Um, she was phenomenal. Um, she was largely responsible for the formation of the Food and Canning Workers Union and for its strength um, over the years. So Ray Alexander was already banned from trade union activity by the time sector came into existence. So, however, even with the restrictions on her open activity, she continued to work behind the scenes, um, advising, writing, researching, and doing whatever possible to assist the workers and leaders of the FCWU um, and the AFCWU and SAC2. So, Ray Alexander was born in Latvia in a progressive Jewish family. Ray was active in an illegal socialist group at the age of 14. People grew up really fast back in the day. So it was this activity which led her mother to make hasty arrangements to get Ray out of the country on a ship bound for South Africa. So though she considered it the correct tactic politically to try to, um, to do political work in a capitalist country like South Africa, rather than go to the Soviet Union, as many others did, because it was the easiest way, so Ray was quite the person from uh, upon her arrival. So two days after she arrived in South Africa, um, she was out buying vegetables and Ray saw African workers coming out of factories and she asked, are you members of a union? And they said no. And she passed by a furniture factory. She asked a mixed group of workers the same question. Some answered yes, others answered no. And she thought to herself, there are a lot of there's a lot of work to be done here. So from the early 1930s onwards, Ray Alexander began organizing workers into trade unions throughout the Cape. She played a leading role in the form in the formation of the Commercial Employees Union. Um, and later she assisted in organizing black workers into unions in transport, chemical, sweet, laundry, tin, footwear industries. So in, in the late 1940s, Ray began organizing the Food and Canning Workers Union. And by the end of November 1941, the FCWU was well organized with branches in many parts of the Western Cape. So the union represented all workers um, in the industry until 1947, when the Department of Labor threatened the union with deregistration if African workers were not removed. So a decision then was taken by the members to set up um, an African FCWU, which would then continue to work closely as an equal partner with the FCWU. So Ray Alexander, along with um, other leaders in both unions, fought hard for better wages 
and working conditions for these workers throughout the 1940s and the 1950s. And they also succeeded in mobilizing workers around broader issues. The food and canning workers were in the forefront of political campaigns initiated by the ANC and other groups in the Congress Alliance. Um, and then in September 1953, um, she was ordered to resign from a position as General Secretary of the FCWU. And pro she was prohibited from attending any gatherings of any nature for two years. And at the bottom of her banning orders, a special um, sentence, it, it was handwritten by the Minister of Justice, Swart. He added that she must not assist in any way whatsoever any group of workers to improve their wages and working conditions. So Ray continued, um, Ray continued to actively assist the workers behind the scenes right up until she was forced to leave South Africa in 1965. So many black trade unions owe their training to her and they will never forget the disciplined young white woman who delivered lectures and generally assisted them in their work. Um, she showed tremendous um, warmth and just amazing um, energy to the black working class. And then we can see um, Harry Guala next to Ray there on the picture. So Guala began um, trade union organization work amongst Africans um, in distributive trade, um, chemical building and brick and tile industries in the mid 1940s. So throughout the years, whenever he was not banned, he led the SAC2 local committee in Peter Morrisburg area and was also very active in the ANC. So Kuala served um, eight years on Robben Island and after his release, he took up trade union work again. And in 1977, he was rearrested and, and he was imprisoned for life. And he remains one of the most respected militants um, in South African trade union history. And then um, there's Becky Lan. I couldn't find a picture of her. It's hard to find some pictures of people. Um, so she replaced um, Ray Alexander as the general sec secretary of the Food and Canning Workers Union. So when the when the um, Lao Tao was banned in 1953, although not listed as a commun as a communist under the Act, Lan received a two year ban for attending gatherings in 1954. She was banned from all trade union activity um, in 1956. Um, make, this made her the sixth um, WC, FCW leader to be removed from office um, since 1950. And then there's J.B. Marx. Um, you can see up there. So Marx was the president of the African Mine Workers Union and chairman of um, Senetu. Of the many African leaders, Marx was perhaps the most influential in bringing younger persons into the into trade union and political struggles. And he was active in the um, CPSA and the ANC. And Marx acted as an advisor to SEC to, um, following 1955. And frequently he contributed analysis and editorial comments in, in, in the workers' unity um, SEC to paper. So then, and we have at the bottom AP... Mati was one of the veteran leaders in Port Elizabeth. So he served as an organizer of the Laundry Workers Union and the African Commercial and Distributive Workers um, Union. And he was the secretary of the of the SA Railway and Harbor um, Union. And at the time of his banning in October 1953, he was the ex-chairman of the ANC in Port Elizabeth. And Mati provided political and trade union training for the militant corps of um, ANC SAC to comrades who led um, the Congress campaigns in the 1950s. Then the last person, no, it's not the last person. Okay. And then um, Mati, John Motabi joined um, the union movement in 1942. And he was a member of the furniture bending and uh, um, Furniture Bedding and Matches Workers Union, and he soon became actively involved in the building and allied um, workers union in the mid 1940s. So until his banning order, which was issued in 1953, once he was once an executive member of Senetu, Motabi worked closely with um, 
Elias Motaledi, Isaac Macau, and George Macau, also Senate executive members, um, banned in 1950s. Um, and as the Transvaal ANC provincial secretary, Motabi often brought um, the workers' struggle into the national liberation movement, and he continued to assist um, sectors following its banning. So we have George Ponin at the top there, and he was, um, I think Ponin was, yeah. So I think um, he was in the, um, what do you call it? Okay. He was, um, okay, something, something I was trying to remember, but it's fine. So uh, he was the first, um, Natal trade union unionist to be banned under the under the act. So following his organization work um, in the 1930s, Ponent became secretary of unions in rope and mat um, in, in rope, mat, tea, coffee, twine, bag, brewing and mineral waters industries. So he was a full time honorary a secretary to the tobacco workers union and an honorary advisor to the Natal Union in tin food, canning, broom, bush, hospital, railway, harbors, chemical, distributive, and municipal industries. Um, and on the political front, Ponin and his a militant wife, Vera, they defied the custom of South African society and married across um, racial lines. Um, so both were, they, they were both actively involved in sector campaigns in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, bringing many younger people into the movement and providing their apartment in, in, in Durban um, for secret meetings. So I could go on and on and on. There were many other union leaders that I'd love to tell you about, um, but the list is endless. So I wanted to show you how key unionists from the decades preceding the formation of SACTU played an important role, played an important part in laying the foundation for the formation of SACTU. So not just the individual, but the trade unions um, that were a part of it. So these are the guys who moved in, who actually moved into leadership roles um, into SACTU, guys from Senetu, other trade unions who, were, who moved into leadership roles in SACTU and the ANC. So these are the guys that educated and trained um, that educated and trained comrades um, in SACTU. And come to think of it, uh, many of the trade unions that these leaders were a part, um, many of these leaders that were um, a, many of these trade unions that these leaders were a part of SACTU, um, they are trade unions. They affiliated um, into SACTU. So now the Congress um, of the People, Clip Town, 1955. So the Congress Alliance organized um, a Congress of the People, a conference which presented the demands for the kind of South Africa the majority of people wanted to live in. So the Freedom Charter demanded democracy, land redistribution, houses, work, security, free and equal education. So the charter became a common platform between SACTU and um, liberation movements. So the apartheid government declared this a communist document, which resulted in the arrest of, um, of Congress um, leadership. So now let's look at the history um, of the Freedom Charter. So, At the Cape Provincial Congress of the African National um, Congress in August 1953, the Cape, the, the Cape ANC president, Matthews, called for a national convention at which all groups might be represented to consider national problems on all inclusive basis to draw up a freedom charter for the democratic South Africa, for a democratic South Africa of the future, right? So little did he realize 
that in less than two years, on a dusty playing field on the edge of what is now called Soweto, the Congress of the People would occur. So it was held in an open field owned by a sympathetic Indian Congress supporter in the heart of Cliptown, one of the few areas in the country where black people could own property in an urban area. So in June 1955, over 300 delegates and observers met to co-create and democratically adopt the Freedom Charter. So the ANC president, um, Lutuli, he urged people to get involved in organizing the COP. He underlined its importance by saying this, why will this as assembly be significant and unique? Its size, I hope, will make it unique. But above all, its multiracial nature and its noble objectives will make it unique because, because it will be the first time in the history of multiracial, uh, our, it will be the first time in the history of our multiracial nation that its people from all walks of life will meet as equals, irrespectively of race, color, creed, to formulate a freedom charter for all people in the country. So delegates then, um, the delegates then presented various points um, which were then open for discussion. If anyone had a suggestion or, or an amendment, they were afforded the opportunity to step up to the podium and make their, um, and make their remarks. So the point was then put to a vote and determining which demands should be included in the charter, the COP National Con Consultative Committee had already drafted a proposed document which was tabled for discussion. So then the Congress started late on a Saturday afternoon and the first day ended with the public reading of the draft Freedom Charter. So the second day, the delegates had the opportunity to discuss and vote on clauses of the draft charter by a simple show of hands. So then, let's look at SACTU's inaugural conference. So right from the beginning, SACTU's leadership emphasized this crucial question. What strategies can be effectively used to oppose the new apartheid provision? So on the 5th and the 6th of March, 1956 in Johannesburg, at the inaugural conference, of SAC to the aspirations of progressive trade unionists from all parts of South Africa were finally realized. Um, here, uh, a handful of workers announced their um, intentions to of organizing the enslaved workers um, in mines, docks, railways, on the farms, as well as every factory and workshop. So the formation of SACTU was strengthened by the principal decision of the, of the Senate to dissolve and in turn merge with the new non-racial trade union center. So the, re the resolution passed at the Senate conference in 5th of May, 1955, is of historical significance to the progressive trade union movement in South Africa. So a policy document was presented at the conference which analyzed the potential impact of the new provisions on the trade union movement. So additionally, the document was put forward, um, put forward a strategy to counter the state's offensive. So one of the most significant documents to come out of the deliberations was the Declaration of Principles adopted um, at the Foundation Conference of SACTU, which lays down firmly the basic principle, principles of what SACTU, um, principles of which SACTU was built. So part of this document reads as follows. So it reads, the future of the people of South Africa is in the hands of its workers. Only the working class in alliance with progressive-minded sections of the community, can build a happy life for all South Africans, a life free from unemployment, insecurity, 
poverty, free from racial hatred and oppression, a life of vast opportunities for all people. But the working class can only succeed in great and noble endeavor if it itself is united and strong. If it, if it is conscious of its inspiring responsibility, the workers of South Africa need a united trade union movement in which all sections of the working class can play their part, unhindered by prejudice or racial discrimination. Only such a truly united movement can serve effectively the interests of the workers, both the immediate interests of higher wages and the better conditions of life and work, as well as the united objective of complete emancipation for which our forefathers have fought. So we firmly declare that the interests of all workers are alike, whether they be European or non-European. African, colored, Indian, English, Afrikaner, Jews, we resolve that this coordinating body of trade unions shall strive to unite all workers in its ranks without discrimination and without prejudice. We resolve that this body shall determinedly seek to further and protect the interests of all workers and that its guiding motto shall be the universal slogan of working class solidarity. And the motto was, an injury to one is an injury to all. So this was what was written in the, um, the basic principle that sector was built on. So we're going to look at now sector's um, actual affiliated membership. So as we can see there in 1956, um, Sector had 20,000 workers in 19 unions. And in 1959, they had 46,000 workers in 35 unions. And by 1961, they had 53,000 workers um, affiliated through 51 unions. So every, so after years of struggle and sacrifice, um, South African workers of all races, but especially African workers, um, had a coordinating body to represent their interests and to fight for their rights um, as workers. So now we're going to look at sectors' response to the 1956 Industrial Conciliation Act amendments. So. What did these amendments do, right? So the new bill, so the new bill, it was designed to weaken um, the trade union movement by dividing the movement along racial lines. So, and um, depriving it not only of its right to strike, but also of its right to control its own funds and to elect its own officials. So, um, for decades of compliance with the provisions of the Industrial Conciliation Act, it, incap in, uh, sorry, it incapacitated the unions. Um, so what did these amendments aim to do? They attempted to impose rigid racial divisions on the trade um, union movement in keeping with the Nationalist Party's ideology. So the amendments led to intense debate within sectors National Congress. So one camp argued that the registration and industrial councils must be viewed tactically rather than in terms of principles. Okay, so let me break this down to you. Um, so this means that there was a camp, there's a group of people within sector who believe that the decision to register their unions and engage with industrial councils should be approached strategically based on practical, practical considerations rather than being guided solely by their fundamental beliefs um, or principles. So in other words, this group was arguing that the decision to participate in industrial councils and seek registration for their unions should not be driven primarily by ideological or moral principles. 
So instead, they emphasize that the need to evaluate the potential advantages and disadvantages in a pragmatic way. So they likely considered factors such as gaining legal recognition, um, negotiating power with employers, or having a formal platform to represent workers' interests within the industrial relations system. So by adopting a tactical perspective, this camp aims to make informed choices that would serve the best interests of the workers and the labor movement, even if it meant making compromises in the short term to achieve long-term strategic goals. So they believe that a pragmatic approach um, could lead to practical benefits for the workers and ultimately strengthen their position in the industrial landscape. On the other um, hand, it was argued that the participation in the industrial relations system represents compromise with the apartheid state, the result of which is the political struggle is, the, is um, irre irretrievably dissipated, leaving in its wake emasculated um, weak unions. So it became a tendency to settle disputes by legal procedure rather than through militant struggles um, of the workers. The sector's response against this act. So initially, the sector management committee orchestrated an educational initiative to counter the effects of this act. So they urged local committees to host community conferences and collect signatures for a petition intended for submission to the government in Cape Town um, coinciding with SACTU's inaugural annual national conference in March 1956. So a, um, a resolution during the conference um, called upon trade unionists within South Africa and across the globe to denounce um, this fascist measure designed to undermine um, trade unionism, right? So this measure stripped workers of essential rights. So it stripped them the rights, um, the ability to work. Um, it stripped them the rights to form unions without regard um, to race. The liberty to, the liberty to democratically elect leaders devoured of state intervention. The freedom to pursue any occupation without constraints based on race or gender. The right to withhold their labor power the autonomy of trade unions to advance their objectives through um, political avenues. Okay, we're gonna stop here. This is part one of the lecture. We're gonna carry on with this, um, I'm gonna carry on with part two of this lecture. I just wanna make the material easily digestible and not, and not just go on and on and on and on. So this will be followed by a part two lecture. So please listen to them um, one after the other. They will be in the test. Both will be in the test. Thank you.